Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. You've got me again. I don't know what you've done to deserve having me. Here I am, but I'm, uh, I've dragged Nina along with me. So Nina, how are you doing? It's us again. I'm doing very well and a wonderful to be on History Hack. Today, we'd like to introduce Helen Amy. She's a writer and historian who specializes in the Victorian period and also in the life of Jane Austen. She's written several books, including Jane Austen's England and The Street Children of Dickens, London. But today we're going to talk to her about her book, Everyday Life in Victorian London. Hello, Helen. Welcome to History Hack. Hello. Thank you. So th- this is a terrific book because it gives the reader kind of a comprehensive look at what the everyday life um, in Victorian London would have been like, really from, from soup to nuts, to use that, that terrible old cliché. But one of the things that, that is interesting in particular about Victorian London that you talk about in your book is that there is a really big chasm, a huge difference between rich and poor in London. And I wondered if you tell our listeners just a little bit about that. Hi. Um, so Victorian London was a city of great extremes. Um, and one of the greatest extremes was between the rich and the poor. Um, the rich or the, the, the richest London, London has lived in grand houses in the West End. And the poorest lived in the foul slums, which were dotted about London. And some of them um, actually lived on the streets. They didn't have a, a roof over their heads at all. Um, and this was really embarrassing in the capital of the world's richest nation. Um, not all people have benefited from this wealth, uh, even though like some of the poor people in London, they've actually contributed to it by their work. Uh, The poorest people were described as the submerged 10th or outcast London. Um, And the better off had no idea how they lived or survived and survived. Um, Surprisingly, the slums that many of them lived in were very close to the places frequented by the well-to-do. For example, off Oxford Street, um, which was where middle class people um, went shopping, just down a little alleyway, you could come you would come to the slums of St Giles's Parish, which were some of the worst slums in London. Um, and it was the social investigative journalists like Dickens and Henry Mayhew who actually went into these slums to see how the people lived and reported about it, making other people aware of how things were. Uh, and the slums were so different to the lives of so many people that they likened their um, going into the slums um, to the journeys into darkest Africa. So just a completely different world and a t- totally different set of people. Um, I know that, you know, one of the things that Mayhew did in his work was he described a lot of the different occupations in the working poor. You know, of course, many of them would have, as, as you pointed out, would have ended up living on the streets because they did not even have enough money to put a roof over their heads. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the different types of work that the working poor did. Um, I think it's, again, it's, it's something that perhaps not many of our, uh, of our audience would have known a great deal about or, or understood. There were a variety of jobs in London um, for the poor, both semi-skilled and unskilled, but there was fierce competition for these jobs. And with more and more people coming to London, attracted by the large casual labour market, um, there were fewer and fewer jobs to go round. And many who came in search of work found themselves struggling to survive among the destitute and the homeless. But those who were able to find work, um, there were quite a few options. Domestic service, for one, um, it was long hours, poor pay, but at least these people had a roof over their heads and food to eat. Mm. The most put-upon servants were the maids of all work who were employed by the lower middle classes, so young girls, maybe 11 or 12, just doing everything to keep the house going. And it was hard physical work. Um, For the men, 
mainly. Um, there was a lot of London was an important manufacturing centre, and there were places where some of them could find work. Um, maybe making bricks in the brickyards or in in the brewing industry. Um, and in, in in London transport, a lot of poor people um, worked as omnibus, omnibus um, conductors and cleaning um, the omnibuses. Other people um, worked in in clothing factories, small workshops uh, making clothes in in the West End where most of the customers lived. Um, and these seamstresses, they worked long hours for poor pay, um, and they lost their jobs altogether when mass produced off the peg clothing came in later in the century mm. um, the docks was another place where people could find work um, men loading and unloading cargo working in the warehouses or in the underground vaults um, but this was very unstable work the pay was low you could turn up for a day and just hang around trying to get work and not get any so that, that was a very um, you know wasn't a particularly good thing, a uh, good way of making money. Um, then the building trade. There's lots of building going on in London. New roads, new houses, um, building the railways and the undergrounds. So the plenty of work there for poor people. Um, oh, and the railways, bridges and the sewers when they were, were rebuilt. So there was a lot of work there, but again, there was a lot of competition. Also, public services, the poor worked maintaining roads and footpaths and parks and cleaning streets. Also, rubbish collection. Uh, dustmen collected household rubbish and took it to the dust yards. They went around the streets with their box carts, gathering it up, and then they take it all to the dust yards. The dust yards were another place for, for the poor to find work. Um, men, women and children were all employed, sifting through the rubbish, leaving the soil and dust. Um, and the dust that was left over went to the brickyards. What was the strangest occupation that that, right. that uh, being you know being a dustman or actually sorting through things like you know dust and rubbish is uh, is, is certainly one of the more um, I, I wanted to say surprising, but that's not accurate. One of the more unusual, at least perhaps to uh, you know to industrial countries. But what was the what was the strangest or oddest occupation that that you found? Well, I found um, a lot of poor people worked on the streets, um, selling things, um, mm. uh, and they worked in markets or actually on the streets themselves. And amongst these street sellers were 20 men who sold squirrels. So these were bought, yeah, um, you could buy practically anything of, on the streets of Victorian London, including live animals. Oh my God. Um, and Henry Mayhew invest, um, interviewed uh, some one man uh, about his job, and he told him that there were at least another 19 people that he knew selling squirrels. They were brought up to London from people in the countryside, sold to the street sellers, and the people he sold to were, um, as he said, he quoted, um, gentlefolk, tradespeople, a few of the working classes who were fond of animals, and well-off people who bought them for their children. Um, and he said that he sold an average of six squirrels a week from two to five shillings each. Wow. So that was the most unusual one I, I came across. I'm just trying to wrap my head around having a pet squirrel. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it's come from the wild. Yeah. Or trying to transport squirrels from, you know, catch them in the first place and actually transport them and then be able to handle them in a way that, that, that allowed you to sell them. It's, I have to say, that is the most surprising. If you'd asked me guess, I would not have said squirrel seller. So that's, uh, that, that, that is, uh, that is definitely, uh, definitely an, an unusual occupation. Unusual. Yeah. I have and really I gloves. Sorry, I'm really going through the logistics of squirrels. <laughs> Chris is fascinated by this whole idea of what, how would you handle squirrels and and and, and what would you do? Um, if if you were, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about children, and of course, you know, you mentioned the maids of all work, um, you know, and 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 young girls. Were the poorer children educated at at all during this period? How how was that? Um, how did how did that work? What sort of educational opportunities might they have had or not had? Well, the the um, children of the underclass were very rarely educated. Mm -hmm. um, 
they may have had a bit of education in, at a Sunday school. They might have learned to read there. Sunday schools taught children to read so they could read the Bible. Um, they may have gone to what was called a dame school, um, schools, little schools run by elderly ladies in their own home. And for a few pennies a week, they will teach children the alphabet um, and just basic skills. But apart from that, there was nothing for them. Um, and in fact, Henry Mayhew was really surprised because he interviewed so many children and very few of them were educated at all. And of course, that would have made the difference between um, being able, you know, to be on the streets and, and being able to get a job that had a future for them. Um, yeah, so that their lives were very hard. Which is a big contrast to the other end of the social scale in London. Yeah. The rich a lot more opportunities, didn't they? Yes, certainly. Um, the better off children uh, went to private, boys went to private schools or public schools. There are also charity schools, but um, which were means tested. But that they wouldn't, they would have gone to working class children. Um, there are also the ragged schools set up by people like Dr. Bernardo. Um, he started working as a ragged school teacher, and when he realised um, the terrible lives these children were living, um, he actually started taking them in and, and providing a home for them. Um, so there were people there who were doing what they could to help them. Um, another one was Lord Shaftesbury, who set up the it was called the Field Lane uh, Ragged School. It was part of the Field, Field Lane Refuge, um, where he also provided well, body provided them with education, training to do a job, and with somewhere to live. But there was not nearly enough of that. Uh, certainly, in the earlier part of the Victorian reign, towards the end of her reign, more people getting involved um, and helping street, street children out. That's just answered a question I've had. I live in Medway, and there is a ragged school building just off the great lines and every time i walk past it i wonder why it's called ragged school so you've actually answered the question that it's been nagging me for years yeah, not got... it, because they were too dirty and ragged and um you know just just not not, not respectable enough to go to any other school that makes um, sense where that is in chatham is right next to where the slums used to be so yeah, yeah. Right, thanks you just solved, solved a question that i've been mulling over for years <laughs> yeah no that's the reason and there were, you know, more and more of, the, of these schools opened as the century went on. And as people became aware of the plight of these poor children, more people were willing to help them. But it wasn't until the end of the century when state education um, came in that they were actually taken off the streets because they had to go to school. Hmm. And, the, and there was enough. Enough schools were then built and provided for, for all the children in London. Right. But that wasn't until... Um, the, the, there was an Education Act in 1870, um, bringing in state education, and then uh, it was some time before it became compulsory. So by the end of the century, all children had to go to school, and there were people out on the streets looking for children who were playing truant or you know, still working as street sellers. The thing is, a lot of the, of the parents of street children, and not all of them had parents, but, but a lot of their parents actually needed them to work mm. um, to help with fi finance and the family. So it really, it was very difficult for those parents when their children had to go out, uh, had to go to school rather than out to work. It became quite problematic for chimney sweeps because by the time they were old enough to leave school, they had to be quite small and young for that. Yeah, that's right. Then um, I think I'm quite not quite sure when um, chimney boys uh, they stopped allowing children to go up chimneys, but it, it wasn't through the whole of the century. I think it's about mid-century. And and of course, you know, as you as you point out a bit in your book, you know, the uh, the Victorian era, you know, from the from the ascension of uh, of, of uh, Victoria to the throne, to the point where it becomes the Edwardian era, is a massively long period, and there is a huge amount of social change and economic yeah. change and political change. So that prior to 1870, as you said, you know, there is no legislation that compels. Um, children to go to school and so if you are living hand to mouth if you are a casual laborer and you know you are or you're or you're procuring and selling squirrels which yeah. is which is you know not not anything that you can you know you can count on then the role of children in terms of you know either getting work or looking after younger children so that you know so that you could work was mm. uh you know, kind of outweighed the fact that uh, perhaps they needed, you know, if they had learned their letters and learned their sums, they would have had greater opportunities um, yeah. to, 
up the social ladder and you know not to live such a such a precarious existence children were not actually treated like children and if they committed a crime um children over the age of 14 were sent to adult prisons where they were flogged and made to pick oakum and go around the treadmill um so you know it wasn't really recognized that children uh, that childhood was a special period in their lives and they needed nurturing and looking after um, and it's very sad reading some of the stories of, of the street children, how older children were looking after the younger children in the family, um, either because they, you know, they were all orphans or because their parents were at work. Right. Um, Childhood is very much a privilege of the middle classes and the yeah. upper middle classes then. Um, That's right. You- you so you you have to be economically stable or you have to have enough money for your children to have the privilege of actually experiencing a childhood yeah um yeah. some street children slept in um Hyde Park and the other London parks uh, yeah. and they sleep on the benches there and in the morning they go and have a wash in the serpentine and then go off to do their their job in the street and then a few hours later the children of the middle classes will come there with their nannies. And and that really makes you think about the big difference between the children barely surviving with, with the pampered middle class children. Mm. Um, and going to a London park, which is sitting there for a few hours, you could see both. Right. I, I have to say that's going to change the next time I go into the London parks. That's certainly going mm. to change my perspective on how that space was used, you know, by, in, in particular, by by children during that period that's a mm. very it's a very compelling image and, uh, and one little boy slept inside the roller that was used to smooth up the grass in the park he must have been tiny to fit in there but gosh, yes, yeah, exactly. somewhere somewhere Mayhew notes that this little boy slept in the roller oh gosh mm. it, it, yeah it is it is just heartrending to mm. consider, isn't it yeah uh, you know, and as you pointed out, you know, the great wealth and then the, you know, the, the, the other end of the spectrum. Um, I, I, I'm going to insist that we, we make this slightly more upbeat. Um, yes, okay. What sort of um, entertainment and leisure activities uh, did, did people experience during this year? And I realize there's a huge difference in the social classes, but I'm just wondering, you know, we, we, when one thinks of everyday life, you know, there are at least the occasional moment if you're working class or poor and perhaps a great deal more time um, for entertainment, leisure, you know, things like that. What, what sorts of things would people have done? What was available to them? Again, um, like so much in the Victorian period, it all depended on your class. Yes. Um, one thing that was important was that people had more money to spend on leisure and more free time because um, bank holidays had been introduced um, and wow. Saturday afternoons, um, you, had the, you had Saturday afternoon off work, you finished at midday. Uh, previously, the working classes would work six days a week. But right. um, the sad thing is there were plenty of facilities, in fact, for all classes, but um, the very poor couldn't um, avail themselves of a lot of these um, facilities because they didn't have the money to pay. And there's right. usually a small entrance fee. Um, so the upper classes enjoyed the opera, a gentlemen's clubs, the theatre. They liked riding horses and promenading along Rotten Row in Hyde Park. Um, the middle classes, again, enjoyed a wide range of entertainment, concerts, art galleries, theatres, watching cr- cricket. Um, but all of these cost money. And even the new attractions, like panoramas, um, these were scenes with 3D figures. And the most famous was Mr. Burford's panorama in Leicester Square, which showed scenes from the Civil War. Um, and Wilde's Monster Globe, which was um, built in Leicester Square to attract people who visited the Great Exhibition. Um, Madame Tussauds Waxworks. There were so many things that even the working classes couldn't afford um, mm-hmm. to go to. Mm-hmm. But the very poorest... Um, they had their own theatres, which they sort of makeshift theatres. They set up in um, old shops or the back of pubs in the slums. Uh, they were called penny gaffs because they only cost a penny. Um, right. They were disreputable places. A lot of alcohol was drunk. Um, and the contents of the drama, dramas were indecent and even violent. 
Um, okay. But that was one one place that Paul could go. Right. Um, they were even excluded from parks. The, uh, the Royal Park, St James's Park, had a notice on the gate saying only people of respectable appearance were allowed in. But oh, wow. in the Victorian period, a number of new parks were built. Um, and there was one Victoria Park in the East End where the poor um, went every weekend and they, any time they had off work. So they were allowed into that one and some of the other new new parks. Um, um, but And the, the poorest people enjoyed illegal sports like prize fighting and do- dog fights, which were held in secret locations in the slums. Mm. So they had their own entertainments. Um, but the thing is, they actually didn't have a lot of time off work anyway. Right. They were struggling to make ends meet. Just surviving was all they could sometimes do. Um, and of course, there were the street entertainments provided by poor people. And other poor people could watch and just slip away if they couldn't afford to put a penny in the hat. Um, but yes, yeah, so there, there, there was plenty on offer in London, but um, not everyone could enjoy it. How big a problem was alcoholism? Because I know from when I read about the Ripper killings, there's a lot of talk about all being often inebriated. I don't know whether that was yeah. just because the people who were doing the investigations at the time were just dismissing it and saying, oh, yeah, they're just drunk. But was it was it that big of a problem? No, yes, it was, actually. Um, there was a strong link between alcohol and crime. Um, and a lot of, for the, the very poor, um, outcast Londoners, they were called, um, they drank to drown their sorrows, and, and you can't blame them. Um, and then having... Um, had too much to drink they would go out and commit a crime and they need um then they'd be able to spend the profits of the crime on more drink so it really was a problem and there was a lot of debauchery and violence centered on the pubs and the gin palaces in the slums um saturday night being a particularly bad night uh, you know because the poor had just been paid and they'd go off and spend their money um you know drinking too much to manage to get through their lives um Yes, yeah, so it was it was a big problem. Um and a lot of the a lot of the crime was, was down to drink. I think it was Kate Eddowes who'd been um given some money for some work and then she just went straight down the pub and had spent it all from memory. Mm. It's been a while since I've looked into that. Yeah. Mo- moving on to something else that's gross and disgusting. The River Thames has oh, yeah. has quite an influence over over London in general. Um mm. not all not all good but not all bad. What kind of influences did it have? Um, well, the important thing to remember about the River Thames is, is that was the reason why London was was settled by the Romans. They called it Londinium. Um, it was a tidal river and navigable, connecting them to the rest of the Roman Empire. It was vital to London's prosperity, uh, being a major trade route leading to the largest port in the world. So there were both positive and negative um, factors as far as the Thames was concerned. On the positive side, the docks provided a lot of work for people and they were the source of a huge turnover of money annually. Um, and ships were built on the River Thames um, and there was, there was plenty for people to do, if you, um, plenty of jobs available. It was also a good place to to go and watch interesting spectacles, like the, the annual spectacle of the Lord Mayor's proces- um, coronation procession on the river um, and the uh, university boat race. Lots of people crowded to the Thames banks to watch that. Um, launches of ships, like the Great Eastern ship um, designed by Brunel, built at Millwall Dock, um, was launched in 1858 and attracted masses of people. Um, and the arrival and departure of royal barges, taking the royal family to and from ships when they were going abroad, um, also attracted lots of people on the riverbanks to watch. Um, but on the negative side, the river was, was seriously polluted, um, and it was the source of much of London's drinking water, so this was a real problem. Um, and this caused a lot of ill health with you know, waterborne diseases passed on by the bad water of the River Thames. Um, and the, early in the Victorian period, the river was wide and slow flowing and it regularly flooded. So there were areas of London that were often underwater, like Battersea, Bermondsey and Wapping. And on the other hand, it sometimes dried to a narrow stream. Um, 
it's very heavily congested, like the roads and the pavements. There are all sorts of vessels. Um, it's very difficult, very slow moving. You have huge ships, commuter boats, pleasure steamers, uh, little pleasure boats, all vying for space on the Thames, which made it, it dangerous as well. There were frequent collisions. Um, most famous disaster was the Princess Alice steamer, which collided with a, a vessel carrying coal. Mm. And more than 600 people died in that disaster. And then if the weather was bad, foggy weather, um, made conditions on the river very dangerous. And of course, there was crime as well, thefts from moored vessels. Uh, and sometimes ships had to wait months to be unloaded and they became targets of, for thieves. But a number of improvements um, took place and a lot of these negative aspects were rectified. So London Bridge was rebuilt with fewer arches, making the river flow more easily. Um, the embankments were built and the river became easier to navigate. A new sewage system put an end to pollution and new docks were built um, with the increasing size of ships. They had to build new docks and they, these were enclosed by high walls. So people who wanted to steal couldn't get to them. Um, and Tower Bridge was built, which allowed large ships to pass down into the Pool of London and that freed up space on the river. Um, so a lot of the problems were actually rectified during the, the Victorian period. I think one of my favourite stories is um, with the with the river. You had the Great Stink, yeah. And Parliament it started to stink out the Palace of Westminster. So Parliament sat to try and figure out what a solution would be, and they went with the cheapest, most efficient solution, which was to perfume the houses of uh, houses of Parliament so they couldn't smell it, and then it was someone else's problem. <laughs> right. But in the end, they had to do something about it because that wouldn't that wasn't sustainable. No. Um, and because once it started affecting them, people have been campaigning for improvements, all sorts of sanitary improvements, and very little was done. But once the people in the House of Parliament were affected, well, it didn't take long for them to get a new sewage system built, and the problem was solved quite quickly. Yeah, and, then, and they like encased the river um, river fleet as well, which is uh, was quite a problem too by that point. Yeah. Yeah, some of the tributaries also, well, I think most of, most bodies of water in London were polluted, even the serpentine. So, it, you know, it didn't help the health of Londoners. But it, when all these improvements um, came about, then the health of Londoners improved as well. That uh, brings us quite neatly in a segue to uh, when it comes to everyday life, uh, one of the most common issues would be disease. Um, what were the health concerns beyond, beyond the river? <laughs> and how did they, they combat them? Both the worst problems were caused by the pollution of the, the river um, and also the graveyards were overflowing um, and had been for a long time. Um, burials were piled higher and higher and until um, they were dangerously close to the, to the surface. Um, one of the real problems, though, was the fact that, that no one understood how much disease was spread. They had this theory called the miasma theory. They believed that... Um, infections were spread by bad vapours in the air. But of course, that wasn't the case. And so much of the um, the disease in London was waterborne diseases like typhoid and cholera. Um, and various Acts of Parliament, they did, they did pass Acts of Parliament to, to improve things, um, but it, it, progress was very slow. Um, and nothing really, um, there was no real improvement until the sewers were built. Uh, and new sanitary legislation was brought in and people with infectious diseases had to be isolated. Astonishingly, they'd never worked out before, but by separating the people who were suffering from it, whatever it was, separate them from other people, it didn't spread. Um, improvements to medical care also helped. Better off people could pay for their own treatment and care at home, but there was very little for the poor. Um, there were some voluntary hospitals but not enough um, and, and the poor had to rely on charity dispensaries and workhouse infirmaries um, but really they didn't have much of a chance if they got one of these serious illnesses and then in, in the 1860s a public hospital system was brought in um, and, and things began to improve um, doctors and nurses would have better training better regulation um, and, and things began to look a lot better one one thinks about um, the improvements in nursing that uh, that while 
uh, assisted and, you know, developed by numerous people were in many ways because of her position of power and wealth led by Florence Nightingale, um, you know, who after the Crimean War, of course, works with, uh, you know, ends up working with St. Thomas's and has yeah. a pretty, pretty strong hand in in uh, thinking about, you know, um, how patients are going to be cared for and, and supported because, of course, physicians, you know, doctors would just show up, walk around, but the day-to-day care was very much nursing. So I know, yeah. you know, that certainly had had an impact, at least in that area. And then, of course, those ideas begin to spread and, and, and so on and so forth. So that certainly yeah. was- well, well, Florence Nightingale um, put into practice uh, what she'd learnt out in the Crimea. Right. Um, before Florence Nightingale, nursing was not a respectable profession at all. Right. So when she came back home, she set up training schools for nurses at, at St Thomas's, um, and she she wrote manuals on how to look after patients. Um, and and after that, things did improve. Um, and they, they, once that these nurses were trained, they were regulated, um, as, as doctors then were as well. So there was much more regulation and training of doctors and nurses. And this all helped to improve the, the chances of the poor. Um, we've kind of mentioned them already. Um, you can't mm-hmm. really sort of talk about London in this period without mentioning 1888 and the Whitechapel killer. But yeah. As obsessed as people are with with Jack the Ripper, there were other criminals, weren't there? It was, a, it was a really quite a big problem. Yes, crime was a, a serious problem in London, um, and some areas were so steeped in crime that, that they were beyond the control of the, the police. Um, and there was a widespread fear of crime because a lot of crime was reported in the papers. So um, the middle classes were very frightened, and, and, and um, when Jack the Ripper was uh, committing his crimes there was a well even before then there was a great fear of crime Mm. um but poverty was linked with crime um and the slums were notorious breeding grounds for criminals um they congregated in the common lodging houses in the slums to plan their crimes so there's a lot of petty crime theft pickpocketing shoplifting um picking the pockets of people in in omnibuses you know um Women used to, women particularly um, were involved in that sort of of crime, and also there were there was a lot of burglary. The homes of the well-to-do people in the West End were regularly bur- burgled, and sometimes the servants were involved in this, and they'd let the criminals in while the family were at dinner. And there was um, a, a burglary in Lowndes Square in the, the mid eighteen hundreds. Um, and burglars got in and they took away £3,000 worth of valuable goods without being spotted. Um, and apart from burglary there, burglary, there were other violent crimes. Um, sorry, can I go back on that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, there, apart from murder, there were other violent crimes. And in the 1850s and 60s, there was a lot of anxiety caused by a spate of rotting um, Screwing someone up, it was called in street slang. Mm. Usually two, two criminals worked together. One would strangle a victim with his arm, rope or wire, and the other would rob him while he, he couldn't defend himself. Um, and some of these cases were so brutal that the victim died. Um, another horrible crime in the Victorian period was um, baby farmers who were women um, paid to look after babies while parents, often single women, worked. Um, they often neglected the babies in their charge and fed them with opium to keep them quiet, which sometimes killed them. Mm. Um, there's a most a notorious case of a woman called Margaret Waters who yeah. killed five children in her care. She was found guilty and executed. But there was a lot written about that at the time, and it, you know it's, it's all added to the fear of of crime and um, punishment. You know, it's a, it's a very harsh penal system, so. So transportation ended in the 1850s and, and more prisons had to be built. So people would be imprisoned, or maybe um, isolated in, in one cell on their own. They were given jobs like picking oak, which was old um, rope 
covered in tar and they had to pick it to pieces to be reused for something else. Um, and there was the crank where they were, um, they had to sit inside the cell turning a, the handle of a crank round and round and, um, for hours on end or on the treadmill where they just had to keep going round and round in this uh, wheel. Um, all very pointless, um, didn't achieve anything, but it was, you know, it was part of their punishment. Um, but actually, the crime rate in London fell during the Victorian period um, and it became, by the 1880s, the safest capital in the world for life and property. And this was due to the Metropolitan Police becoming more professional and efficient um, and other factors like the introduction of fingerprinting. So crime actually did improve. The crime rate improved over the, over the um, Victorian period. Uh, you had commented earlier about uh, about um, children and the fact that you know because the children of the of the working classes and the poor were not thought of as children that you know those punishments extended extended to them. There was you mentioned Dr. Bernardo, and there was wasn't there a shift in terms of the, you mentioned this earlier that by the latter part of the century, the 19th century, that it appears that whether it's through just greater information in the press or um, social criticism, you know, you think of the the fictional works of Dickens, who focuses very much, right, in in so many many of his works, he's highlighting various social ills, whether it's the workhouse system and Oliver Twist, um, or uh, you know the, the the plight of the poor, um, and and one thinks of the, uh, the 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 graveyards, the intramural graveyards in Bleak House, and uh, the court system also in Bleak House. By by the eighteen eighties, there are people like Dr. Bernardo, aren't there? What what other um, what other social changes um, did you find as as one gets to the latter part of the century that that I'm wondering may have contributed to a drop in crime or, or hopefully a an improvement in living conditions? You talked about sanitary changes. Are there other uh, changes, social changes, in, that occurred during that period? Yeah, there's one one quite significant fact was that children by the end of the century were being and young people were being um, not being. Um, treated like adults if they committed a crime, uh, they were sent to reform schools. So they were taken out of the adult um, penal system and, and were looked after and, and taught, taught, um, given training for jobs um, and taken away from adult criminals. So that was an improvement. Um, and the, uh, the biggest improvement was state education for, in the lives of children. But there was also a recognition by the end of the century um, that children needed protecting um, and the LSPCC was um, founded, which became the NSPCC. Um, and that there were, were lots of other people apart from Dr. Bernardo. There were um, church missions going into the slums to help people. Uh, middle, middle class ladies went in as visitors, helping mums who needed help. And um, there was a lot more awareness of, of, of what was going on in the lives of these poor people. And there was... Once people knew how bad it was, there was an outpouring of help and middle classes very much wanted to do what they could. Um, And particularly with children, there was a better understanding of how they should be treated. How how much of it comes down to, uh, because William Gladstone, when he's Liberal Prime Minister, he has a vast Mm. interest in helping the poor. How much much of the um, reforms come down to... I don't want to be politically biased, even though I am, that it comes down to the Liberals rather than the... Um... I think as the century progressed, governments of all um, parties were just aware that the, the poor needed a lot more help. Um, there were all sorts of changes that, I mean, like the slums, by the end of the 19th century, um, the first council housing was being built, although that was the London County Council that was responsible for that. But there were, um, there was a, a, a lot of, of help was was becoming available um, towards the end of the century, um, and that actually the slums didn't improve because, uh, although there were fewer of them, um, the, um, the when slums were demolished for development, the developers were supposed to provide homes for displaced uh, slum dwellers but they didn't so in fact the few remaining slums got worse and worse 
And, and at the end of the century, the East End of London was just riddled with the most foul slums imaginable. Um, so it wasn't all settled by the end of the Victorian period, although things did improve quite a lot. Um, when Victoria died, there were still areas that needed improving, and one of those was the housing for the poor. I think also of all of the, the massive amount of, and you'd mentioned this earlier, you know, for example, the development of the embankment and the development of transportation. If you were, you know, if you're if you're building all these railways, if you are building, you know, later in this, very later in the century, you're building an underground system. If you are um, doing slum clearance in order to widen roads or pave roads or build more commercial buildings, all of those people do have to go somewhere. And yeah. some isn't really, you know, that's that's not something that um, that parliamentary government is really tackling. Um, no, they just relied yeah. on the developers doing what they'd agreed to do, but in fact they didn't. So um, there were a few, a number of sums, but they were considerably worse than in the beginning of, of the period. Um, right. In fact, one of the the Royal Courts of Justice in the, in the Strand was built on the site of an enormous um, slum district. Um, and all those people had to find somewhere else to live. And, of course, they had no money. So a lot of them would have ended up on the streets. There was little thought about, although the government did think about the need for somewhere else for these people, but developers just did what they wanted and, and ignored the government. And, yes, you're right, the government didn't take any action. I suppose at that point, because the the people involved aren't voters. No, no, that's hard. right. Um, working classes didn't get the vote to, well, working class men in 1867, but, um, you know, there's the working class and then the underclass. Um, mm. They just didn't have any, any rights, really. No one, and well, as I say, people became more interested and, and started to help them. Um, but there was, at the, at the end of the century, there was still a divide between the richest and the poorest, but there was also a lot of awareness of the poor and people who were interested in helping them. Seems to be a shift. Um, you you mentioned uh, the very famous uh, Samuel Smiles book, uh, mm. 1859, which which reflects self help. Which doesn't that sort of reflects the idea during the period that if you are poor, and by this I mean not working class poor, mm. but if you're poor to the point where you you can't keep a roof over your head it's because you're not a good person you don't work hard enough you spend what little money you have on drink um you know you are somehow morally suspect um and there seems to be a difference between the working poor who are working hard and that's their station in life and it's sort of a you know a a, a god ordained kind of situation and the underclass who are um, just, you know, vicious and, and nasty and they don't wash. And somehow the responsibility for betterment is with those people with a, one might say, a lack of awareness of their situation. Yeah. Um, access to running water in many cases that could be. Yeah. Um, with regard to self-help, which is a very important ethos and helped a lot of Victorian people, um, free libraries were set up to help people, um, help working classes to improve themselves. Um, there were night classes uh, they could go to to give themselves a better chance. Um, there were the new museums that were set up in South, built, built in South Kensington following the Great Exhibition, um, and the profits of the Great Exhibition uh, were used to build these museums. Um, and that was another place that working people could go and improve, learn and improve themselves. But you did have to pay to get into them. And that was the same with the art galleries. A lot The Victorians loved looking at paintings, um, but you did have to have a bit of money to get into an art gallery. So there were lots of things there, uh, lots of facilities whereby you could help yourself. But if you were the really, you know, the really poorest people, outcast London, just trying to survive, um, they couldn't avail themselves of these facilities. A lot of them couldn't read. Uh, well, most of them couldn't read or write. Um, so the, the self-help really was for the working classes and the middle classes. Exactly, exactly. I think about the um, uh, the Great Exhibition and the fact that they had 
Uh, you know, it was open at a certain price, but then on particular days, they changed the price and made it within the grasp of the working classes. And I, I, I don't know if it was shilling days, that seems like a low option, but uh, days where you could go um, and the price would drop so you could see all the amazing wonders of the empire. But again, as you pointed out, that's not available to the incredibly poor. That's that's a way for the working classes to... Yeah to enjoy and see and experience, um, but not not be uncertain. Very poised. Um, yes, a lot of people came up to, with the railways. You could buy a combined ticket, which ticket that, that combines your rail fare with entrance to the um, exhibition. I think, um, it was on certain days. Prices were cheaper. So, And a lot of six million people went to the great exhibition. So a lot of um, the working class did go. Um, and for a lot of people, Going up to London by train and going to the Great Exhibition would have been the first time that they'd seen London. Right. The very poorest did actually benefit indirectly because um, so many visitors coming up to London, those who were selling on selling goods on the streets or selling coffee or refreshments, they all gathered around Hyde, the outside of Hyde Park and they had far more um, customers than they'd had previously. So right. they did. But but because of that, a lot more people tried, um, you know, started up stalls and selling on the streets. So there was there was more competition, but there were certainly lots of lots more people who would buy their their food or, or whatever they were selling and, and and little souvenirs and things. Which leads us on to finishing up on a bit of a lighter note, since we've done crime, disease, and pestilence and poverty. <laughs> um, what what was shopping? Because you know, as you said, London is the the, the capital of the empire, and we've got ships coming on in from all over the world. What what was shopping like in in London for people? Um, this without mentioning the uh, nefarious squirrel trade. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, again, it depended on your your social class. Um, there were lots of shops, and, and more and more shops being built. Um, at the beginning of the Victorian period, the shops were all around what we now call the square mile of the city, which was a residential area, and. Um, when the West End was developed, with all the new new housing developments, all the grand squares, the shops moved in that direction. Um, so the better off Londoners, for food, they would probably have fresh food, vegetables, milk delivered to their door. And there were small grocery shops they could go to, like Harrods, which was originally a grocer's, a grocer's shop, to get their other food. Um, but the poorest people... Um, they shopped in the markets. They were they were not allowed in respectable shops. They had to had to buy all their their food and lots of their other things on the streets from street sellers or in markets. Um, the, the, the again for the the better off Londoners, um, Regent Street and Bond Street were very exclusive shopping streets. Oxford Street wasn't as exclusive then. Um, it, it was mainly um, food shops and drapers shops and a few clothes shops, uh, and shopping actually became um, a, a, a pastime for middle-class ladies. They were called the lady shoppers. Mm. Um, and the big shops in uh, Regent Street and Bond Street, um, they catered for the, the carriage trade, as they called it. Um, shoppers arriving in their carriages, which they'd park outside the shop uh, and they would the footman would stand by the carriage while they went in to do their shopping or goods were brought out to them while they sat in their carriage they didn't even need to leave their carriage to do their shopping um and it was in the west end that department stores were first built they started off with small drapery shops and they got bigger and bigger um and expanded the range of goods um and the better off shoppers could go to shopping arcades which were avenues of shops like the Burlington Arcade in Piccadilly. Um, and there are also bazaars, which were um, shops with a, a covered, or, or stalls with a covered, um, a, a roof over, over, the, over the heads. And people could buy nearly everything that they needed in these bazaars. Um, and there was one near Baker Street where you could go to buy a carriage or some furniture or a carpet. Uh, you know, there was plenty, uh, there plenty of options for, for the better off. Um, but for the poorer people, they bought their clothes from secondhand shops. They bought from pawnbroker shops, so unredeemed goods would be sold off cheap. Um, and they they would go to the marine stores by the river, which were originally um, 
they originally sold items that you need on a ship's voyage, but they had become really had become junk shops. So a lot of, of things were available for the very poor there. Um, second, Mon- Monmouth Street, which is now Shaftesbury Avenue, was a, um, a street where nearly all of the shops sold secondhand clothes. Um, so there was something for everybody, but um, it, again, it depended on your class as to where you would go. Really good. I, it's it's one of those things that when you, people think about Victorian London, you do get kind of caught in the sort of the Dickensian um, view of it. But it's it's actually, as you said, it's quite a long period and a lot going on. Yeah. It's forming a lot of change. And um, I think your book covers it very, very well. Um, would you mind um, just re- reminding everyone the title of your book and where they can get it from? Yes. Everyday Life in Victorian London. Um and it's published by Amberley Publishing. <laughs> Buy them online. Uh, yeah. And the and the History Hack Bookshop, which yes, we yes. Will, uh, have online, um, uh, bookstore.org. Uh, buy it from us, not from not from the uh, Amazon place, because uh, if every sale we get a small slice of money, and Helen will get more money than if she uh, gets it from <laughs> from Amazon, which is always Absolutely. good because then it's not used for rocket fuel. So everyone's a winner. Shop at us. <clears throat> That's not a plug, <laughs> or maybe it is. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much helen this has been a really interesting conversation uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today and we we greatly appreciate your taking the time to speak to our listeners on history hack thank you thank so you our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book this is just a small taster as a result we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests latest books you can support them and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top of the line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.